Okay, so we're back again. Um, with uh, I'm here with uh, the internet sensation that is Pavlos Petermenos. Uh, <laughs> we took a break, and hopefully we will come back and do this, and the sound may be a little bit better this time. Okay, so we're carrying on with uh, what is now part six, because we've decided to break them up into break each letter up into little bits. So we're now on part six of the introductory lecture for compiler optimization. Okay, uh, how do I get to the next page? There we go. Okay, so we've done uh, syntactic analysis in, uh, we got up to syntactic analysis in the last one, and now we're doing semantic analysis. So, Pavlos, do you know what semantic analysis is? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so just a quick review. This is the idea that the syntactic analysis has produced us a uh, an abstract syntax tree, but uh, there are lots of things that could be invalid here. We may not, we may have try to use variables before they're defined. We may uh, try to assign a float to a string and all this kind of stuff. So syntactic analysis will ensure that all of these things that we want to be able to do are correctly done. Okay, And uh, essentially what it does is it goes through the AST and uh, checks that the meaning of the AST is correct uh, in terms of the requirements of the language. And it will decorate the AST with information that it finds. So as it determines what the type of a variable is, it will tag bits in the AST, or in the symbol table at least, uh, with what the values, what the information that it's got uh, is, are. Mm. Okay, uh, we use symbol tables, which are basically just a uh, hash table mapping names in the programs to information about them, their types, values if necessary, etc. Uh, and the symbol tables are uh, nested for the different scopes that we've got. So that as you enter a scope, for example, as you enter a function, often you can declare local variables to that function, so the sim symbol tables are nested for that purpose. Uh, and what the the... the basic way that we build uh, the do, do the semantic action uh, semantic analysis is that a lot of compiler generators when you have written your grammar they allow you to embed semantic actions into the grammar that are pieces of code that are executed when the grammar rule is successfully fired if that makes sense so that it can do things like okay now you've matched this declaration statement telling me that int x equals 10, I can now run a semantic action and record that x as an integer and do whatever else I need to be able to do. Okay, so that's the basic way. But uh, it's a little bit painful. And if you ever try to do this, you'll find that quickly it can become uh, quite difficult to manage. And people have designed things called attribute grammars instead, which propagate information around in a more rigorous kind of way. Yeah? Excited by this? We'll see. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, let's have a look at what a symbol table is. So the symbol table typically provides two operations, uh, something to look up a particular name and find out what information we have about it, and something to insert a name into, uh, uh, insert the information about a name into the table. Okay. So just basically a hash table. But as I said earlier, they are a stack. Uh, and what you find is that when you need to know what a name means, you typically search the stack recursively, going deeper in the stack until you find the names uh, in it. Okay, so we have an example here, uh, down at the bottom. And, oh no, okay, wait, sorry, so what have we got here? Uh, this is. Do, do you need me to tell you? Should should somebody have possibly looked at the lecture notes before we before we started doing this recording? Hmm. Okay. So uh, I, th I think what you want to uh, talk about here is n being defined in two different ways. Yes. Let's do that. Let's. Well, let's first of all talk about what a scope is. Do you know what a scope is? Uh, I, Sorry, I just told you what a scope is. I, I, I vaguely remember. I didn't. I wasn't paying attention <laughs> when, when you were talking. Okay. So you normally start in one global scope. Let's call it scope zero. Uh, okay, so we see uh, scope zero here, uh, which is our global scope, and we've defined a few names inside it. And when the uh, semantic analysis stage is going through the AST, it will sort of notice that n is a character uh, string, uh, and format is that, and it'll put those into the global scope. Now, when we declare a function, we enter a new scope, and you see that as scope one here. Uh, and we can start to define new names, which are local, which can shadow the earlier names, okay? So that later when we use n here, uh, this one here, uh, then what will happen is that we will search the scope recursively. So we'll say, do we have anything in this scope? Uh, and, well, actually, in this case, the for loop introduces a new scope so that we can define this integer here. Uh, 
Uh, but it will say, do we have something to find in this scope? No, we don't. So we'll go back to the next scope and we find this one, this N, not this N, because it finds this one first and does that. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's great. That's pretty much, I think that's all we need to know. For uh, when, when we get I, it goes, it finds it in this scope, in its own scope. So that's fine. So these curly braces also introduce a new scope. So you can have local variables inside here. So basically in C or Java or something like that, whenever you see a curly brace, it introduces a new scope. But uh, as noted here with the uh, for loop, you have other sort of weird little scopes that the language introduces whilst it's declaring other things. Okay? Mm -hmm. Super happy. Great. Okay. So, um, semantic actions, what are they? So, as I said, these are little bits of code that we tag into the grammar that are executed when we match a production in the grammar. So, down at the bottom, you can see here, we've got uh, a declaration rule, uh, which has one production, var id equals expression, in some language that I just made up. And uh, in this point, we want to record that id has been used. So, the symbol table will insert this name possibly plus some other information, into the uh, this, this code here, this semantic action, when that is matched, we'll fire that rule, and the symbol table will be updated with the variable that we've got. Right? Kind of good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but it... Uh, and then when we come to use those, we, we can have other semantic actions which check other things. For example, here, when we... In an expression, when we use an ID, we want to be able to check that that name has been defined somewhere, so we can assert that the thing exists in the symbol table. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice and easy. Uh, you also find that there are semantic actions which do other things. For example, I think Antler has conditional semantic actions which allow you to actually derive which rules are appropriate. You have semantic actions which are executed not on uh, successful checking, but in order to select which direction you can go down in the path and things like this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the problem is that side effects can be a problem if we do the if we match this rule successfully, but then go further down and discover that we have to backtrack but past this bit. Then we've just inserted something into the symbol table and we have to remember to take it off when we come back up. Right. So these side effects that we get in semantic actions can be rather uh, tricky and rather irritating to reason about um, and cause the maintenance of your grammar to be. Um, rather more complicated than it should be. So, uh, what people have come up with instead is an idea called attribute grammars. And the idea here is, is that with each node in the, AS, in the AST, we associate some attributes. Okay, so an attribute might be uh, what is the type of the thing that this expression produces. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or if it's a constant value, it might be the constant value that it's got. There are all sorts of things that you can have uh, in here. Types are, are pretty common as a thing that you would have here. Okay. And then we have rules explaining how these types, uh, how these attributes uh, either bubble up or get pushed back or sent over to neighbors and things like this in the, in the tree. Does that make sense? Um, no, I not quite. Not I didn't quite. get that. Okay. So well, let's look at an, at, at an example. So here, uh, in the first one, we've got uh, a very simple rule which says that an expression goes to a term, uh, an operator, and an expression. And we want to be able to know what the type of this expression is. Well, if we say that the type of this expression is derived from the types of the two uh, children, mm -hmm. right, by some function, then uh, we can assign a type here to that node based on that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So uh, this, I think, is called a synthesized one where it comes up from the children uh, as opposed to inherited where it comes down from the parents. Um, and similarly here we have, uh, for term, we have a similar thing where the type of the term is basically the type of its direct child. Uh, and we might have different rules depending on the operation that you are performing here. Mm -hmm. Okay? So an attribute grammar has these things here uh, tagged uh, into a card. That is a terrible drawing. Um, <laughs> that's not what I meant to do at all, but you see, you see the bit that I'm talking about. Uh, has those rules associated with it, and then something else comes along for you and manages the uh, flow of these attributes and their information around the tree. Mm -hmm. Okay? Which makes life a lot easier to reason about and to work out what's going on. Okay. Uh, so we might find, for example, that, they, that the function we've got for the types... Uh, 
uh, let's see. This, here's a here's we've got a function up here which is uh, f op, uh, and we've in this case we're assuming that we've got different functions depending on the on the operator. But let's for the moment just say that they're always the same just for 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 ease. Okay, so uh, we start with a tree, uh, an AST, and we know that this is an int because uh, we started with that. Uh, although we've actually noticed we've, we've simplified this tree so we don't have terms and things like that. But we can do more complicated things. Um, and what we're going to say is that for a binary expression, the this function over here uh, tells you what the type of the expression is based on the on the children of the expression. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, here we've got int and a real. So int here and a real here uh, gives me a real here. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so that means that that one is a real. And you notice we do exactly the same thing here to give this one uh, up here a real. Okay? Mm -hmm. Easy peasy, right? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So you often see these type matrices um, around in uh, in in attribute grammars uh, and actually also in data flow things that we'll come to in a later lecture but you'll, you'll see these things quite a lot um, and these matrices can encode error conditions for you so supposing uh, this is a terrible example this should be more like a string or something like that to make sure that you can't add things together but supposing that uh, adding a real to a double uh, is an error I have no idea why that would be an error, but supposing that were, then we could encode that in the table by saying there's nothing in there, and therefore if somebody tries to do that, tell them that they have messed up somehow. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. But maybe a string or a pointer would be better to, you know, you can't you can't add a, 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 a pointer to a string. A pointer to a, to, a, to a double, right? Can you? In C? Oh, no, probably not. But you have to cast it to an integer first, eh? Probably. Mm. Okay. <laughs> So, there we go. Does, it, does this all make sense? Yeah. Are you happy with this? Do you feel now fully comfortable with writing attribute grammars for the rest of the time? Uh, I don't know. Good. I'm glad we got that decided. <laughs> uh, yeah, I understand the concept. I don't know exactly how do you write them. So Right, okay. So, it depends on your grammar yeah. uh, writing program. They they all have their own different formats for doing these things. So, the typical the one used with GCC is what? GCC. I don't think GCC uses attribute grammars. I think okay. it would. I think I think it all uses hand baked, um, difficult stuff that uh, you just kind of assume that it works. Cool. I like this thing. Do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I say that, but if there are any GCC people out there who are listening to this stuff, um, please forgive me because I, I've never really looked in huge detail at the front end, other than to realise that I probably don't want to look in huge detail at the front end. Okay. Uh, also, this is the front end, so you don't need to know. It's fine. <laughs> we can ignore this. Okay. Uh, so there we go. So that's uh, that's this lecture. We'll break them up into very small bits. So um, not this lecture, this part of the lecture, and we'll see you in a bit for the next one.